I don't know what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> Honestly, I'm going to I'm going to uh, speak out of the New Testament today, um, and and then some out of the Old Testament too. So, oops, wait for one second. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna go to uh, Galatians chapter three. But honestly, I feel like what God gave me today is uh, it's, it's it's like this message this this word comes out of the entire the entire you said chapter three three uh, it's like uh, it's such a simple thing but it's something God uh, has been speaking to me about all week and and uh, so I just I sort of. Uh, I just picked Galatians 3, but I could have picked a, a whole bunch of other places because the, the it's it's this it's just a truth that's permeated throughout the Bible. Uh, we were with uh, some Cindy and I were with some second-rate friends this week. Uh, by that I mean they they were they were not. They're not second-rate people. They're they're a, it's a friendship. They're like friends of friends. So they're not really they're not in our. I have I have really you you all are good friends. You're like each one of you I know as for yourself now. I I don't like when the first time you came here you came because somebody invited you, and the first time you were here when. You you were uh, a friend of a friend, but now I know you, and so now you've become my friends. And a lot of you, I look around the room, and I don't know how you got here anymore. You just you just belong here. You're you're our friends. You're my friends now. So however you got here, whoever invited you, is irrelevant in that relationship. Not that you're not still their friend, but we were with some friends of friends. So so it was like what I call a second rate friendship. And uh, good people, good good people, and and they're, uh, I would probably be their friends if if I spent more time with them, uh, but um, I noticed uh, just really good people, and they they're normal people. They 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 have a normal lifestyle. Uh, they're not poor. I wouldn't say they're wealthy. They they they're. they're Financially, about like we are. Uh, socially, they're about like we are. They're they're just normal people. But as we were as we were kind of hanging out with them, I noticed there was a hole in their life because they don't really know Jesus. They don't really know God. Now I don't know because they're because they're second rate friends. They're, I'm not that intimate with them. I, I don't know them that well, and. So I'm not really sure what, what their relationship with God is. Just turn it down a little. Just turn it down a little bit. There we go. All right. Uh, so, so I don't I don't really know what their relationship with God is. But what I noticed is, is I. I I don't really think they walk with God on a daily basis. I think possibly they they know God, but they they don't walk with Him. They have like a, a head knowledge of Him, but they're not really intimate with Him. And I know a lot of people like that. I see a lot of people like that in the world. And then there's a lot of people I see that uh, don't even acknowledge God. They don't know God at all. He's like he's like he doesn't exist in their mind. And I'm not saying that to condemn them or or judge them. I'm just saying it's, it's they've never been introduced to them. But what I noticed is that these people, there's like a hole in them. There's like something missing in their life. And I don't even think they know it. Because what I notice is that they they it's almost like they try too hard. It's like they 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 they're they're almost trying too hard to live their life. And uh, so I, what God spoke to me was, he said, he said this, he said, I created 
all, all of mankind. He said, I created them with uh, a hole in them or a, a missing part. Mm -hmm. And he said, God said, I'm the only one that can fill that hole. I'm the only one that can fill that hole. And, and he, uh, any, it seems like anytime God speaks to me for more than a half hour about any subject, he always takes me back to Genesis now. <laughs> and, I, 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 and so uh, he took me back to Genesis and, and he said, I, he said, in the beginning, he said, I created man in my image. And as I was, as he was speaking to me that word image, the first thing that came to my mind was a statue or a, a sculpture or a, a, a non-living thing. And he said, I, he said, I created man in my image but he said that image didn't come to life until I breathed into them life. Mm -hmm. Now think about this, because this is the picture that God gave me in my mind, that, that he created us in his image, but then he breathed life into us. Yeah. When you read the account in Genesis chapter 2, the, uh, or Genesis 1 and 2 in the creation story, you see that that God created all the other animals as living things. It says he created the birds and the fish and the other animals. He says, I created them living and put them out in the, in the, in the world. But when it came to man, he says, I, he says, we need to create man in our image. And there was something about that language that arrested me. And I thought, okay, God said, I created man in my image, but I also, because they were an image, that image had no life. In fact, when you read the story, we know that God took dirt, dust, and molded or formed, it says, the, he, he formed us, and he formed us in his image. But I, I picture God kneeling down and scooping up the, some of the dirt that he had just created a couple days before and I don't know if he spit or used water or what he did to make the dirt moldable or how he formed us but somehow he formed almost what we would think of as a statue or a, an image that had no life in it and then after that image was formed he breathed life into us not only now that life was more than physical life mm -hmm. at that point. It was it was the very spirit of God or the very nature of God. So he formed us in his image and then breathed life into us. And in doing it that way, it created or or built in us a a, a, a empty spot that only he can fill. Yes. Now stay with me. So when man was created, when each one of us was created, because God created each one of us, he created us with two identities. We have a, uh, we're going to call the first one our natural identity or our flesh identity. But we also have a second identity, and that second identity is a spiritual identity. And, and each one of us have two identities, or sometimes we call it two natures. But today we're going to use the word identity. Not, I'm not trying to confuse it or make it uh, mysterious or spooky. This is just how God spoke it to me, is that we have, we, we have, when we were created, when you were designed, you were given at birth two identities. You were born naturally. And so you have a natural identity. My identity started 60-some years ago. The day I was conceived, I, I, was, given the, uh, I was given a natural body. This, the, that's what you see standing in front of you. This is my natural identity. This natural identity is someday going to die. Probably sometime between now and... And I'm guessing 30 or 40 years from now, my, it, it, at some point, it's, my, I'm going to breathe my last breath and my natural identity is going to cease to exist. It's going to die. It's going to go away. 
That's my natural identity. My second identity, now I, I'm, not, I'm not speaking doctrine here, so don't anybody, don't anybody get too excited about this and start looking in your Bibles for proof of this or, or disproof of this. But one of the things that, I, that, that uh, I started to think about was my spiritual identity. And I don't know if you, it, maybe God doesn't work with you, but God allows me to think about stuff. He allows me to ask him questions and ponder things. And so one of the things that I've been pondering, and I'm not sure if this is true, but I think it might be, is I believe that my spiritual identity, I believe that, and this is a new thought for me, so don't get too hung up on this, but I think it's possible that my spiritual identity was actually created on the day of creation. That each one of our spiritual identities was created on that day. And then your spiritual identity, I, I, I don't know how this works, but somehow your spiritual identity sort of hung out someplace <laughs> and waited for your natural body to be conceived so that your spiritual identity could inhabit your natural body. Now, I know that might be a little weird for you, but it's something for you to think about. Now, understand something. Today I'm going to be saying some things that might trigger some some thinking in you. It's all right. That's what it's supposed to do. You don't have to accept it as truth. You don't have to just say, well, Paul said it, so it must be true. In fact, the, the opposite is probably true. You probably should say, well, Paul said it, so it's something I need to think about and, and uh, ponder and ask questions, not necessarily of Paul, because he probably doesn't know the answer anyway, because he speaks about a lot of stuff that he doesn't know anything about. And But, but this is how God works in me. God... God puts things in me, and then he lets me ponder it. And I think he wants to do that with you. It's part of how he draws you into relationship with him. I've said this many, many times. God wants to have relationship with you. He wants that more than anything else. It's more important to him than anything else. Is, is he wants you to enter into a, a working active relationship with you so if i say something today and you're not even sure well maybe that's not how it works maybe that's not true just think about it because that's what god is trying to do today he's trying to draw <coughs> us into relationship with him and that means he wants you to ask him questions about stuff he wants you to think about it and ask him well what about this what about that and so forth so so we go back to these two identities because each one of us have these two identities. And when God created mankind, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, both of those identities were in, in they were synchronized with each other. They were sort of on the same page. They were they 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 existed and had the same goal, and that goal was to to have that identity that was in God. Because remember. As we were, when we were created, we were created with this vacuum or this hole in us that God put there so that the only way we could get that vacuum, that hole, that blank spot in us filled was by coming into relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Now, the way it worked in the Garden of Eden, from what I can tell, is that God would actually come to the garden in the cool of the day, it says. I don't know if that was in the morning or in the evening is how I picture it in the cool of the day, when the day was either right in the early morning or in the evening, God would come to the garden and Adam and Eve would hang out with him. And in that hanging out with him, in that, in that spending time with him, it would, that, that vacuum, that hole, that, it would be filled. Now God, that's the way God designed it. And both of the identities that Adam and Eve had, their physical and their spiritual, would be in they would be synchronized in that relationship in getting that whole film. But then we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3, along comes the serpent. And along comes the serpent with his lie, and remember the lie? Mm -hmm. If you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you will be like God. Now, the lie 
a part of the reason why the lie appealed to Eve was because every day Eve, Adam and Eve, would have to wait for God to get that hole filled. Because they had this hole in them, they had this vacuum, they had this empty spot in them. Every one of us knows exactly what I'm talking about because you have all felt that emptiness inside of you. At different points in your life, if you were honest, you would probably recognize and know that it's almost a daily thing. That, that, you, that you need to, to have, there's a part of you missing that, that is just not there. And, it, and if you walk with God, you'll find out that you can get that hole filled by walking with God. That's what Adam and Eve would do. They would do it physically in the garden. Along comes the serpent. The serpent says, you know what? If you'd eat that fruit, if you'd eat from that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you wouldn't need God anymore. Because that knowledge... This is what part of the lie was. And part of the reason why it appealed to Adam and Eve was because they could have that hole filled without having to wait for God. You remember, Satan told Adam and Eve, if you eat this fruit, then you will be like God and you won't need him anymore. You'll be independent. You'll be like God. Now, the problem is, it was a lie. It was a lie. It didn't work. Because even though Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they did what the serpent promised, they did what he said, as soon as they did it, it turned out that the hole was still there. But what it did do was it separated the two identities. The two identities now became separate in their, in their uh, sort of their goal. So now the rest of time, the rest of creation, mankind has gone through their life with one identity wanting one thing and the other identity needing something else. I won't say that the two identities are at war with each other because I don't think that's quite accurate. But the, the two identities are often in opposition of what they want because the spiritual identity, that's the identity that, that I believe was created at the beginning of time, maybe before, that identity is always wanting and seeking God. But the natural identity is the identity that was affected by sin. And so that natural identity is always seeking something else. It's seeking its own fulfillment. It's seeking its own gratification. It's seeking what it wants. And so you go through your life Seeking something that cannot fulfill you. Now, thank God, in the garden that day, God said, you know what? Because this, this break has taken place, and now these two identities have been sort of separated, we have to make sure that man doesn't have access to the tree of life so we're going we're gonna to put an angel up with a flaming sword to keep man from coming into the garden where the tree of life is so that the, second, the, 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 the fleshly identity can die. Because if, the, if, if we stay in our natural identity, then we will forever have to live in this in this sort of like this separated state. The only way that we can be restored is for our natural identity to die, to pass away. Now here's the thing. Your spiritual identity can't be destroyed. It can't die. That's why it talks about in the Bible, it talks about your spiritual identity 
it's not going to die. It's either going to spend eternity forever and ever and ever. It's going to exist somewhere forever. It's either going to exist in heaven or in hell. But it's not going to die. Our natural identity, our fleshly identity, thank God, can perish. So, for all of creation, for all of time, and and for all of your life, you have fought this battle within yourself, between your two identities. You have one identity that's your flesh that's always trying to promote itself. It's always trying to get what it wants, whatever makes it feel good, whatever whatever puffs it up, whatever. You, you, you know what that's like. But you also have a spiritual identity, and that spiritual identity is trying to... to uh, fulfill or to, to become what it was created to be, and that was the image of God. Now, both identities, in order to, 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 for them to be fulfilled, they have to, the only way you can fill that hole is to spend time with God. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what God showed me. When I was, when I was, hanging out with these friends God told me he said I said these people got this hole in their life and and I don't know how to I I, I don't know how to help them because because they don't need anything by that I mean they they're pretty much self self sustaining people they have plenty of money they have a nice home they have nice cars they have all the food they want they're not going to starve to death they have clothes on they have a roof over their head they don't really need anything and i thought how do i help them fill that hole because they don't even know that that hole is there and if i walked into these people's lives and i said you know what y'all got a big old hole in your life <laughs> that ain't gonna fly that would be rude. It would be hurtful to them. It would, if anything at all, it, 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 I would run the possibility of them being offended by me and they wouldn't want to hear anything I had to say. Send me their address. Yeah. <laughs> so you can offend them. Yeah. And then you follow up and rescue them. No, because it wouldn't do any good. All they would do is be uh, offended. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I said, God, what can I do? And God said this to me. And now, now listen very carefully because I want to, I want. He said, I just need you to go in there and be Jesus yes. to them. Yes. Come on. Yes. Okay, now here, now listen very carefully because I'm going to say something that's so profound that it might take you a couple of minutes to get get it. But he he said you need to be Jesus to them. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And I thought, all I got to do is go in there and, and be full of Jesus. Be, be filled with the Spirit of God. Talks about it in Galatians, I think it's chapter 4 or 5. He talks about what, it, what the fruit of the Spirit. The, the love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, all that. All I need to do is go in there and let Jesus fill me up. Let the Holy Spirit flow through me. To be Jesus to them. So I thought, I can do that. I can be Jesus to them. But then almost immediately, he said, but you cannot be Jesus for them. He said, be Jesus to them. But he says, you cannot, and he says, you, you can't even try because it'll become offensive and it'll backfire if I try to be Jesus for them. You understand the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So God is saying to us, we need to be Jesus to the world. That means that we need to show the world Jesus by our life. Remember, our identity... What Brenda said a little bit ago is God wants to change your identity. He wants he wants to he wants not so much to change it, but he wants to to marginalize your fleshly normal identity and maximize your spiritual identity because that's the one that, that is created in the image of God. 
So he wants to he wants to maximize our our spiritual identity that's created in his image that walks in his presence and marginalize our our fleshly image. The one thing he doesn't care to mess with is our personality. Mm-hmm. What's it look like when a person's Jesus form? That means that that uh Everything you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the life of Jesus, that's what you look like. Everything that Jesus did, everything that he was, that's what you look like. You, you, you become Jesus. You, God, you let God so much control your life, so much be in your life, that you become him. Now, the challenge is, and this is the real challenge, and you, don't, and you should never take this for granted is there's there's no everybody does this within their own personality can you imagine what a disaster it would be if i tried to act like her that'd be a disaster it was the same thing would happen if you tried to act like me you have your personality i have my personality god's not interested in changing that he's not interested in making you like me what he is interested in is making you like him. Mm-hmm. Not your personality, but your identity. Right. You already have that identity in you. It's just a matter of which one is going to have the most the most sway. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say this. You cannot destroy or kill your natural identity. Mm. Because if you could, mine would be death. Mm. Because I spent almost the entirety of my life, my adult life for sure, trying to put that guy to death. And he just keeps coming back to life. He is always rearing his head. He is always showing up, oftentimes at the most inopportune moments, when I least want him to be there. He's the one that's sticking his nose in where I don't want him to be. If... That guy could be put, and some of you can testify to this because you've tried it too. And you've had the same result. You've put him to death, you've put him down, you've starved him, you've kicked him, you've beat him up, you've knifed him, you've shot him, you've stabbed him, everything. That guy just does not die. That guy will not be dead until you draw your last breath. So you've you've got to learn to feed the spiritual identity so that he's more powerful, so that it has more weight, so that it has more sway on your decision making, on on how you behave. Come on, true. You can starve yourself. You can put yourself to death. John, the Baptist, said, "He must increase; I must decrease." Yeah. But you can't kill him. You can put him to death, but you can't kill him. Okay. What's that? I said I am crucified with Christ. Yeah, but he's still going to show up. You have to, it's a it's a continuous process. Yes. He said I am crucified with Christ, but it's a constant it's a constant uh, putting down of that identity, so that you can become more like Jesus, so that you can be Jesus to the world, but the thing is, you cannot be Jesus for the world. Now, here's where I think the church has gotten into trouble, is we've turned it around. We've tried to be Jesus for the world, but we don't, we're not really being Jesus to the world. If you're working with somebody that doesn't know the Lord, and you're, you're witnessing to them, how do you become Jesus for them? What do you, I don't, don't get the want picture. To be for them. You, you just live. Yeah. You just live in front of them. No, I mean, you said don't be Jesus for them. Don't be Jesus. See, what happens is when you when you try to be Jesus for somebody, then you try to become their conscience. Mm-hmm. You try to you try to fix Holy them. Yeah. You try to change them. You try to make all the stuff that you think that is wrong with them. You try to fix it on your own power, yeah. because that's where the church has gotten in trouble. We've mm-hmm. tried to take over that role. Oh, yeah. Psychology. Now, part of it, part of it's because we understand we're supposed to be Jesus to them. That it's real easy to 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 get over into the other lane 
It's like it's like you're traveling down a highway and there's there's nothing really to keep you from drifting from one lane to the other. We're supposed to be we're supposed to be Jesus to them and show them Jesus by our lifestyle, by the joy that we have, by the peace that we have, by the love that we have, by by how we uh, how we talk and how we act in front of them. They should see Jesus in us, but we have to be careful that we don't cross over into that other lane where all of a sudden we're trying to tell them this is what you need to do to clean up your act. This is what you need to do to fix your life. That's what that's when you get into trouble when you start trying to be Jesus for them. And I told you we were going I don't we still didn't get to Galatians chapter three and I <laughs> You guys deserve better than what you get. I can tell you that. Uh, I'm, I'm not even in the right version here. Uh, so all of this, all of this, God was showing me out of Galatians chapter 3 because in the book of Galatians, Paul was dealing with, with this subject. In fact, most of the, most of the letters in the New Testament... We're, we're connected into this because what would happen is Paul and Peter and John, the, the apostles, were planting churches all around the known world. Christianity got kicked out of Jerusalem. Remember the, 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 the Pharisees and the, 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 uh, the, the, the lawmakers, they all thought they were doing God a favor, so they were persecuting the church. God said, you know what, I'm going to let you persecute the church because in persecuting the church... They're going to be so persecuted that they're going to leave Jerusalem. Hmm. Well, when they left Jerusalem, they didn't leave their Christianity behind. They took it with them. It was God's way of sending missionaries out right. into the known world. So, so the apostles followed all these Christians that were getting persecuted. So you're a Christian in, in Jerusalem, and, and the Pharisees come knocking on your door and say, uh, if you don't renounce the name of Christ, we're going to put you to death. So they would say, well, we got to get out of town. They'd pack up all their stuff and say, we're going to go live with Uncle John and Aunt Susie uh, over in some other city. And they would go live over there. And so when they left, they took Jesus with them. And so the apostles would then go over there and they would plant a church over there. So you got all these little churches popping up all over all over the place. It was God's way of repopulating the earth and spreading Christianity. So you got all these churches spread out all over the place, and the apostle Paul and Peter and John and and they would send out these these missionaries that would go help establish these churches. They would they would plant a church, they would set it up, and it would be functioning. It operated a lot like we operate. And uh, there would be some some uh, more mature Christians there, maybe, and they would uh, they would operate, and they would be bringing people in and preaching the gospel, and people were getting saved, and the and the the, the name of Christ was getting promoted and spread throughout the the known world. And then the the apostles they would say, well, we got to move on to the next city. There's another group of Christians over here that need us. They would move on, and so they they would travel from city to city promoting and spreading and, and building these churches. But then what would happen is after they would leave, they would, they would crop up in the churches problems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there was, there was people that wanted power, they wanted authority, they wanted to have position, and so they would stand up and they would start preaching a gospel that was contrary to the one that, that, that was true, the true gospel. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in the city of Galatia. There was a church there the Apostle Paul had planted, and after he had planted it and left and moved on, there was a problem that cropped up. And the problem was there was a group of people that stood, and stood up and said, you know what, we need to go back to the law. We need to go back to promoting the natural man. And so they, they started promoting this false doctrine, this, this sort of this false religion, and the Apostle Paul wrote the letter of Galatians to that church to straighten some things out. And that's what he said here. He, would, he said in, in verse 1, he said, You foolish Galatians, 
who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. The Apostle Paul's pointing out, he said, when I was there, I, I gave you the pure gospel. The pure gospel is that Jesus was crucified. That's the way of salvation. Everything that we need is all tied up and wrapped up in Jesus. Mm -hmm. The simple message of the cross. Yes. Yes. Nothing more, nothing less. But along came some other men. They wanted position. They wanted power. They wanted authority. They probably wanted control of the offerings that were coming in. And so they started preaching a different gospel. And so the Apostle Paul writes and he says, Who's wow. changed your mind? Who's turned you away from the very simple preaching of the cross? He said, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? There's those two identities. Yeah. He's talking about those two identities because what was happening is when you get saved, we all know how we got saved. When I got saved, I did it by believing in Jesus. Yeah. Every person that's saved, that's exactly how they got saved. God didn't save me because I'm good. Because I'm not good. There's not a person in this room that got saved by being good. In fact, every one of us got saved in spite of not being good. We got saved from the opposite of being good. We got saved by believing, by trusting Jesus. The Apostle Paul had one simple question. He said, that's you, you, you embrace this new identity, this spiritual identity, by believing, by faith in Jesus. He said, why is it now you've abandoned that and you've gone back to trying to live by the law? By, by the natural identity. And he goes on and, 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 and explains in the rest of this chapter, and he uses the story of Abraham, how Abraham, when God first called him, Abraham believed God, and he, was, he, he followed God because of faith, not because of the law, not because of the natural identity. And God is calling us today, and he's telling us our success, our, our, our uh, ministry, our ability to help people is not going to happen because of our ability to keep the law. You know, most, most Christians will tell you, oh, we're New Testament Christianity. We don't believe, we don't believe the Old Testament. The, the law was for the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. But the problem is that the church, the body, has adopted what I call the New Testament law. Hmm. And it's a whole, it's, it, it hmm. looks and acts exactly like the Old Testament law did. Because the Old Testament law, turns out, couldn't save anybody. Because nobody could keep it. In fact, Paul said in Galatians 3, he said the law wasn't given to save people, only it was given to show people that they need to be saved. Well, the same thing's true of the New Testament law. We've got a whole bunch of people today that are trying to live under, uh, it's like a, it's not even an official thing. It's not, it's not even written down anywhere. It's just a bunch of rules and regulations that we've sort of adopted and tried to, tried to form to live by. Only nobody can do it. It doesn't work. Because God never intended for us to live under the law. He always intended for us to live under grace. That's how we came to him. That's how we come to him. That's the only way anybody can come to Jesus is through grace, yes. not the law. Yes. And Paul was saying in Galatians, why is it you've given up your right and to come to God in grace and have tried to, to change it over to come to him and by keeping the law? 
And the same thing is true for us. If we are going to reach the world, if we're going to, if we're going to effectively change people's lives, if we're going to help people, the only way we can do that is by giving them Jesus. By showing them Jesus. Not by us trying to get them to keep the law that we ourselves can't even keep. Mm. My holiness is not going to help anybody because I'm not holy. The only thing that I can do for people is show them Jesus. But I cannot make them accept him. I can do my best to make Jesus look appealing by letting the Holy Spirit run my life, by living my life under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and letting Christ live through me and people can see Jesus in me. But I cannot be Jesus for them. I cannot force them. I cannot, I cannot manipulate them or try to somehow change their life with my thinking. God said, live, be Jesus to them. Folks, be Jesus to the world. Be Je Go out of here. Go out of here and be Jesus. In your personality, but in your spiritual identity. But don't go out of here and try to be Jesus for the world. It will not work. All it will do is backfire, and all it will do is push people away. Because the world will see the difference. Mm -hmm. The world will know. Be Jesus to people. When God spoke to Abraham, Paul said in Galatians, he reminded the people in Galatia, he said, when God called Abraham out of his, where he was at and called him into the place that, that he wanted him to go he said I'm going to make you a blessing to the entire world mm. God's call on Abraham was more than just Abraham leaving his home God was calling Abraham out of where he was out of the world into the land that he had promised him but he also said, when you go there, I'm going to make you. I'm going to bless the entire world through you. God wants to do the same thing for us, with us. He's calling you out of the world. He's calling you out of your natural identity. And he's saying, I want you to, I want you to learn how to fill that void in your life. By coming into relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, then I will make you a blessing to the entire world. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I don't need you to fix the world. I need you mm -hmm. to go be Jesus in the world and then let me work. Mm -hmm. I don't care how charismatic you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how good you are at keeping the rules. And I'm looking around the room and I don't see anybody good at, that's good at keeping the rules. I don't care how good you are at that. You are not going to fix the world. But you can change the world by showing them Jesus. By letting Jesus live through you. It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing because we spend our we spend an inordinate amount of energy trying to improve ourselves, trying to trying to be more acceptable to God and each other, which is a totally stupid thing to do, but we do it anyway. Where I'm trying to impress uh, you all, 
by how spiritual I am. You're not impressed. I'm not impressed by how spiritual you are. So none of us are impressed with each other. But we spend all this time and energy trying to do that. And what God is saying, I don't need you to do that. I just need you to let me live in you. I just need you to let go. I need you to let the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you. I'll change you. I'll make you what I want you to be. I'll fix all that fruit you thought you lost. <laughs> I'll take care of that. Yeah, he's gathering all up. He's, you haven't lost anything. Yes. God's saying, just let me do the work yeah. in you and around you. It's a crazy thing. Be Jesus to the world. Yes. You don't need to be Jesus for the world. That's all I got for today. Alice, remember last week when we 